Sverige och välkomna till det presskonferens för det bästa gången. Det är planen vi make a few opening remarks after which we'll be happy to take the questions. Well, thank you very much. Good morning, and thank you for being here at such uh, short notice. But of course, uh, we've had a, a very long night, or short, depending on how you want to take it, here at the agency, uh, working uh, permanently. I'm here with the Deputy Director General for Nuclear Safety and Security, Lydie Evra. Uh, she and her team have been working uh, the, the whole night, um, given the circumstances in, in Ukraine. Uh, which I would summarize uh, as, as follows. I am conscious that you may be in possession of some of the information or all of the information I'm going to share with you. Uh, what uh, I can tell you is that what we uh, are telling you is uh, confirmed information that is coming straight from the Ukrainian regulator or straight from the uh, Zaporozhye uh, nuclear power plant where we have uh, contacts uh, at the moment and permanently uh, through the night. So um, as you uh, have been informed, um, uh, overnight a uh, uh, projectile uh, hit a building uh, within the uh, plant site, within the site of the plant. Uh, this building, um, I should uh, repeat, is not part of the reactor, is none of the reactors, is a training adjacent uh, construction uh, facility to uh, the reactors. Uh, this caused a localized fire which was extinguished by the local um, uh, fire uh, brigade in, at the plant, at the plant. So um, it's important to say that all the safety systems of the six reactors at the plant were not affected at all and that there has been no release of radioactive material. No release of radioactive material. Uh, importantly in this regard is the radiation monitoring systems, so the systems we have to measure the radiation are fully functional um, as well. Uh, however, as you can imagine, the, the, uh, the operator and the regulator have been telling us that the situation is naturally, continues to be extremely uh, tense and, and challenging because of the, of the circumstances. Um, of the plant uh, reactors uh, units, uh, one must say that uh, of all the units that we have there, there is only one that is operating at around 60% of its capacity. Uh, unit 1 was in uh, outage for, for uh, maintenance. Um, units 2 and 3 uh, are uh, in, uh, sa in, in safety uh, controlled uh, shutdown. Um, Unit 4 is the one that is op still uh, operating at, at 60%, and Units 5 and 6 uh, were already being held in reserve, and uh, they are operating normally in low uh, power mode. I must um, indicate that uh, two people have been injured. Uh, these people, according to the information we have, are not operators or um, technical people. Uh, and they uh, are part of the security uh, personnel around the, uh, around the plant. So um, these are the facts. We continue to be in contact with the, with the operators and uh, following the situation, uh, of course, uh, very, very closely. Um, let me now address um, how we are... Um, uh, addressing this, uh, what are the next steps that we are planning, what is uh, possible uh, in the circumstances. Um, as you know, because we saw each other a uh, couple of days ago, uh, we had a special session of the Board of uh, Governors uh, here. And um, at that um, session of, of the Board, uh, I indicated 
apart from the general exhortations and uh, reminders of the importance of uh, the general principles of never attacking a nuclear facility and other uh, important conceptual elements, I reminded uh, member states of uh, a number of very clear points that must never be compromised if one is to ensure safety and security um, at uh, any nuclear facility, be it a reactor or any other uh, facility. And, and, and the, first, the first one of this was the physical integrity, the physical integrity of the facilities, whether it is a, a reactor, as I said, a fuel pond, uh, radioactive waste storage, everything. The second point that I mentioned uh, to the board was that the, all safety and security systems at these places must be maintained and operational. The third point I indicated was that staff needed to be able to fulfill their activities normally. The fourth is that there should be at all times, at all times, uh, off-site power, electricity, so that the uh, facility is able to continue uh, running normally. I also refer to the supply chain that must be uh, always available uh, in case there is a need, uh, spare parts or things that are uh, perhaps needed for repairs. I also referred as a sixth point to the, um, to the radiation monitoring systems that are also required so that we have an idea of what's going on from the perspective of the possible presence of radioactivity. And finally, communication. Communication, which is so important, as you have seen throughout this night. Uh, without it, we would have not been able to confirm the things that uh, we are telling you. Well, everybody agrees. Everybody agrees, not with, without any exception. No country disagrees that these principles must be maintained. However, the first of this, the physical integrity of the plant has been compromised with what uh, happened um, last night. So um, we, of course, are fortunate that there was no uh, release of radiation and that the um, integrity of the reactors in themselves was not compromised, but yes, the plant in a, in a wider sense. But it is obvious that when we all agree on these principles, words must mean something. And we have to act in consequence. So for us, the IEA, it is time for action. We need to do something about this. As I also refer to you, I believe, um, Ukraine sent a request for immediate assistance to us. Um, so, bearing in mind what's, what, what's happening and the risks uh, that we may all incur if this continues without uh, an enhancement and without a recommitment to these principles, I have indicated to both the Russian Federation and the Ukraine, my availability and disposition to travel to Chernobyl as soon as possible, so that these seven crucial pillars are never again compromised. The idea behind this initiative of mine as Director General of the IAEA is to agree on a framework and on a compromise that would commit to not compromise these principles that we all subscribe and agree to. We all know that given the very complicated circumstances on the ground, the logistics for such a trip, my presence in this place are not going to be uh, easy and would not be easy. But at the same time, I believe uh, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be uh, impossible. 
if we are to extend assistance, we have to be there. And the first to be there must be the head of the IAEA. I want to make clear one point. This initiative of mine has nothing to do with the political aspects of this crisis. This is not my mandate. I am not the Security Council of the United Nations. I am not the Secretary General of the United Nations. I am not a self-appointed mediator. It has nothing to do with that. I want to be extremely clear about this. What we are talking about here is a framework under the aegis of the IAEA, whereby Ukraine and the forces that are present there in, this, the context of, in the context of this military operation of the Russian Federation can agree to uh, a commitment to not to uh, compromise these um, uh, principles that I have uh, mentioned. So, um, as I said, um, the facts are this. The request for assistance has been made to us. We are not ignoring it. I am ready to come. Um, I stop here and I take your questions. Thank you very much. So please identify yourself in your media. Thanks, DG Grossi. Jonathan Tyrone with Bloomberg News. Um, can you please just clarify who specifically you're in touch with on the Russian side? You said you're in touch with the um, uh, Enigo Atom in uh, Ukraine and the regulator. And can you also please clarify, do we know right now whether the control room itself at that nuclear power plant is in possession of uh, Russian forces or does the uh, utility continue to yeah. have control of the room? Yeah, of course. Um, um, as I mentioned, I am in touch with uh, uh, Russia and also, of course, Ukraine. Ukraine is my natural counterpart. In this, I should always emphasize because we are talking about Ukraine and they are our uh, counterparts. However, we know, and this is no uh, secret, there's a, a military operation and there are Russian forces there. Of course, we do have a number of contacts when it comes to, to the Russian Federation at diplomatic level and at technical level uh, as well. Um, so. Um, this is the first part. The second part um, is uh, regarding the operation uh, of the, you're talking about the control room and things like that. Uh, here I should emphasize that uh, for the time being it is purely Ukrainian staff running the um, operations there. What uh, we have in this case as we speak this morning at quarter to 11, what we have is in Chernobyl and in uh, Zaporozhye, we have a control, effective control of the site in the hands of Russian uh, military forces. I hope the distinction is clear. Um, yeah, good morning, Albert Otti, DPA, Chairman Press Agency. Uh, just to clarify, you, you, you said you're talking, you, you want, you, you're proposing a framework um, to, to basically guarantee the, the, the safety of the nuclear um, installations from both sides. What does you, what does, how does a trip to Chernobyl contribute to this? Do you plan to negotiate in Chernobyl? I'm, I'm not quite sure. We are, uh, we're going to be sharing some elements with uh, both, uh, both uh, sides and we are going to uh, uh, try to agree. Uh, on that. It's part of the consultations we need to have. But that, that's the plan to negotiate there? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Um, Setsko from Nippon TV. Uh, just to follow up uh, on that uh, statement, that uh, uh, who do you uh, envision as your counterpart that's normally a foreign minister so do you want the foreign ministers of Russia and Ukraine to go there or? I'm talking, of course, I'm talking with the, with the, the uh, political authorities uh, of the countries. And this is also something that we are, we have to know that this is an unprecedented situation. Normally in diplomatic practice, one easy way out is to refer to precedent. It was done in this way. Last time this happened, 
So this establishes some sort of practice or tradition. Unfortunately, here we are in completely uncharted waters, and, but what, is, what animates this initiative is the need to act and to heed this call for assistance, bearing in mind the realities on the ground. Thanks, uh, Lawrence Norman, Wall Street Journal. And a couple, of, a couple of questions. I'll keep it to a couple of questions. Um, do you know who was responsible for the pro projectile that hit the site? Was it Ukrainian forces, as the Russians are claiming, or was it the Russians? And what have the Russians said to you about the uh, <coughs> about sending a team there for for assistance? And what have they said about your idea for a trip? Yes or no? Thank you very much. Uh, what we understand is that this projectile uh, is a projectile that was, uh, is coming from the Russian uh, forces. Uh, I, and we do not have details about what kind of projectile this is. Could be many different things. This is what we understand being the, the situation. And what uh, they, uh, in terms of saying yes or no, uh, both uh, sides are considering it. Any other questions? Uh, Francois Murphy from Reuters. Hi, DG, I'm yes, over here. I'm sorry, Hi. I'm always losing you. Yeah, no, of course. Um, uh, two questions then. Um, what, what happens now, just particularly at Saporozhye, uh, um, you say the Ukrainians are in control of the control room and of the operations, but they're surrounded by the Russian military. Yeah. I mean, so what, what, do you, what do you expect to, 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 ha to happen here? Are we, is, it, is, th is things supposed to stay frozen as they are, sort of a bit like at Chernobyl, or do you imagine something, something else? I mean, what, what direction are things heading in? And then also, I just want to follow up on what Albert was saying. If you don't have agreement for a meeting, why are you specifically suggesting a meeting at Chernobyl? I mean, you could meet these people anywhere. So why is this so clear in your mind? Well, there are a number of uh, technical characteris characteristics that make it uh, uh, advisable um, to, to do it there, um, to have a better uh, idea. Um, and also to be more effective in diplomatic terms. Uh, it's very important um, to be there. Of course, uh, at the end of the day, there might be many different um, formats, if you want. Uh, what we want to uh, indicate here is the disposition of the IAEA to move, to do something about what is going on, and not simply tweet or uh, say things uh, from from Vienna. We are ready to move. Oh. And in terms of the, the, I think one thing is connected with the other. Uh, what we have is a situation which is very difficult to sustain. And what has happened tonight or last night um, is proof of that. I have been saying for a few days now, I'm extremely concerned. This is something which is very, very fragile, very unstable as a situation. And now we have seen that because of this impact of a uh, projectile, we don't know uh, in, and, um, how and um, how it happened. I think it would be impossible unless you had a forensic team uh, there to determine the circumstances, and this is going to be impossible. Uh, uh, you had the kind of, uh, of uh, situation we had overnight, which could have, could have been um, dramatic. So uh, I think that we should not wait for something like this to happen before trying to address it in a more efficient way, since we know what is at risk. Right. And sorry, just to follow up, you, since you're saying, you know, you're describing the situation overnight and you say that you're in regular contact with people at the plant. So what is happening right now? So, you know, obviously we had this projectile hit and there was some, you know, there was some fighting. But right now we, we have uh, this normal abnormality, if I can put it like that. 
No, I, the other day in my statement, I was saying normal operations, but in fact, there is nothing normal about this. Yes, they are running the, uh, the, the, the plants, and I paid homage the other day to their bravery, to their courage, to their resilience, because they are doing, do, doing this in very difficult circumstances. Now we see this happening. For how long uh, can this continue? Uh, so uh, I think it is our duty as an international organization with an important mandate uh, to do safety and security, to do it also when the going gets rough. Hello, DG. This is Jordi from Agencia AFA. Jordi. We're talking here about Chernobyl and this one big site. Do you have any information about the other nuclear plants? Is there any risk there? Have you got any information? Not at the moment. And it's good. Thank you for putting up the slide. What you see here are the six reactors. One, two, three, four, five, six. We have this blue here in this unit, which is the one operating at 60%. At now, this is the one. And this is the building. For you to have an idea, this is more or less a one kilometer. Hmm? And this here is the training center which was impacted by this project here and where there was this uh, pipe, all right? So I think this is thank you uh, to the team for having put up this because this gives you uh, an idea. So this is a site, it's a very, very big uh, site, right? Okay. Uh, yes, Jonathan. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Okay, thanks for the follow-up. So there's obviously another plant with three units, uh, the southern plant, uh, that's near Odessa. More, p potentially more concerning, I want to hear your um, uh, uh, feedback on the VVER 440 Type 213 uh, yeah. reactors that are operating in Rivne. Those have been units of concern but to European regulators and the IAEA for decades. Are these issues that, you're gonna, that, that you want to talk about in Chernobyl specifically? And then just briefly, briefly, you don't have any safety standards about proper procedures in a time of war. By showing us this picture up there, are you suggesting that the proper procedure would be to cold shut down all reactors no, in no, the middle no. of the zone? No, I'm not suggesting that. Okay. Mind you, there are references to armed conflict and to accidents. Uh, there are general differences. Perhaps my deputy director general, who is an international expert on this, could uh, clarify it. But there are generic references, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, to, to, to this. So there are some uh, references that are applicable. And of course, I mean, you are pointing uh, 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 to a, a, a pre-existing situation which is more of a structural nature about um, the safety of a type of reactor. Uh, it, this is not the time or the moment or the occasion to be dealing with that. What we are trying to address here is the situation derived from this particular... I'm sorry, but that reactor has a very shallow containment. This, that doesn't have the kind of depth of defense that these reactors do. You just got out of a really, uh, you, you know, we're, we're, we're fortunate, but that reactor has a completely different containment structure. I take your point. Yeah. Um. Uh, uh, between line, I kind of sense that uh, after the negotiation, if it was were to take place or even without that, do you have a plan to place IAEA personnel in Ukraine to assist their uh, normal operation well, under emergency? Thank you for the question. The first thing that we, can, that we must have is uh, a framework uh, within which to operate. And I would never put my staff in harm's way before going myself and trying to set up these um, conditions. If those conditions were, were met, then one could envisage that. But we are not at that point uh, yet. Thanks a lot. Um, DG, you obviously didn't have the weekend upcoming off. You were supposed to go on a slightly important trip to yeah. Tehran. Um, is that going ahead, and would any visit to Chernobyl or Ukraine be after that? Thanks. Um, uh, no, I would say um, I am still, of course, uh, 
um, going to uh, visit uh, Tehran on this very important uh, uh, official visit to try to address uh, issues that we have discussed on, on different uh, occasions. And uh, regarding my, my proposal for a, for a visit and a negotiation uh, to, to Ukraine, no, it's not part of, it, of this. As I said, we are, uh, I am consulting um, Ukraine, of course, uh, first and foremost, and Russia as well, to see how we could organize that. So it would be after your return from Tehran? Uh, God willing, yeah. Uh, DG, just to follow up, um, uh, I take your willingness to go to Chernobyl as an indication that you're not worried about the safety situation uh, I, there, just because there seem to have been glitches with the radiation monitoring system there. Can you tell us what the I, I'm not concerned that? about the radiation. I am, of course, concerned about the, the, the general situation. This is, a, a, this is a zone where there, is, there are military operations uh, ongoing. It is, it is obvious. Yeah, uh, my question wasn't uh, the best, uh, but so specifically on the radiation levels at Chernobyl, uh, is the monitoring working uh, yes, normally and everything seems normal? It is. Well, everything normal, I wouldn't say. There, there are glitches, but nothing that, that would constitute a major uh, issue uh, at the moment in terms of the, of the radiation monitoring systems which are uh, in operation. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, D uh, David Albright from ISIS asks me to ask you uh, if you can say anything about the um, the safety of the uh, spent fuel uh, in uh, in this power plant. There is no issue with it. There is no there is no problem. There hasn't been any reported uh, situation with regards to the uh, to this. Um, issue of the waste uh, stored there. Well, I thank you very much. Uh, we will be <coughs> keeping you informed of, uh, of uh, developments. And perhaps we will be seeing each other after my mission to Tehran. Thank you very much.